Hello again, everybody. Uh, welcome to the News Project Live on GNAT TV's Facebook page. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director at GNAT TV's News Project. It's a pleasure to be with you again today on uh, Friday, March 5th. Um, and uh, bring you up to date uh, on some of the stories we've been following this week and uh, so forth and so on. And uh, before I forget, uh, if you want to get some additional information about some of the pieces we're talking about, you can check in our comments section and uh, we might have a link or two there uh, to an additional story or a source of information if you wanted to kind of uh, take it a little bit farther than we're able to do um, in our time slot today. But anyway, uh, obviously town meeting was this week. Um, and uh, so we're just gonna go through uh, what some of the towns in our coverage area did this past uh, week, more, uh, Tuesday, March 2nd was the official town meeting day. Um, but of course, this this year things were a little bit different because of the uh, COVID pandemic and uh, so forth. Uh, instead of the typical in-person floor meeting, information meeting followed by voting uh, scenario that we're most mostly familiar with, uh, most towns opted to uh, go to remote uh, virtual Zoom information meetings. Uh, to discuss the articles on the town warning, and that would be followed up by um, Australian ballot voting uh, not only the day, uh, day after a lot of the information meetings, which were a lot of them were held uh, this past Monday evening, although some came a little bit earlier um, and the polls opened on Tuesday, March 2nd, but of course, uh, in a sense, the polls were already open because uh, there was following the example we saw last year during the uh, August primary and then November general election, uh, mail and mail ballots were mailed out or mailed back in or dropped off at town halls. So voting went on um, well before uh, March 2nd. Uh, although, if you wanted to do the traditional uh, uh, thing there, you were able to go to the polls and uh, cast your ballots there as usual. So um, let's see. Uh, overall, as far as best we can tell, voting turnout, though, was pretty much the same as it would have been in a uh, quote unquote normal year. Um, voters uh, elected people to select boards and they uh, uh, voted on town and school budgets and um, passed judgment on some of the uh, articles on their warning. Uh, a lot of towns kept their warnings fairly straightforward and uh, simple. Uh, feeling that this year, with all the uncertainty uh, involved with COVID and, and uh, how quickly the economy was going to be recovering, kind of uh, felt this was a, a year to kind of hold off on some of the uh, bigger, more elaborate things that uh, might have, uh, in another year, uh, seemed like a good, good thing uh, to go with. Um, other, a couple of other towns I should also point out uh, opted to postpone their town meeting uh, to later this spring. Uh, in our area, Windhall, Londonderry, Weston, and Sandgate are going to be among the towns that will be holding their town meetings in April or May. Um, presumably or possibly those might be outdoor events. But anyway, let's just uh, go down through a few of the towns and uh, see what they came up with. Uh, in Manchester, uh, voters gave a gave a thumbs up to just about all the items on the on the ballots uh, from uh, their six million dollar almost six million dollar uh, proposed town budget. Uh, they said yes to a lease purchase agreement for a new fire truck, uh, and also uh, encouraged the town leaders to go ahead with uh, discussions about acquiring the. Uh, already built rail trail and it's already been open uh more more or less uh, a little little complicated there but uh you you can walk it or ride your bike on it uh anyway uh the owners of that trail are hoping that the town will uh uh and they will be able to strike an agreement on the town acquiring the trail for future maintenance um so uh voters said yeah let's let's have those discussions and uh see where we can go with that uh, voters also said yes to uh, supporting the Manchester Community Library uh, and its uh, financial assistance of uh, a little over $243,000. Um, also said yes to a, a water bond uh, 
or a bond to in, to upgrade water lines uh, around the town. Uh, that passed by a pretty wide margin, 996 to 150. Uh, and voters also said yes to supporting the Manchester Business Association with uh, $50,000 uh, to help them market the town uh, for out-of-town out visitors. Uh, incumbent Select Board members Jan Nolan and Heidi Chamberlain uh, will be back on the Select Board. Uh, Jan Nolan was running for uh, re-election. Heidi Chamberlain had been appointed uh, last November and has now been now been elected in her own right to a uh, term on the board. Down in Arlington, voters approved a $1.4 million town budget and uh, basically passed all the articles on their warning with the exception of one that uh, called for the select board to appoint a new town treasurer. That was defeated very narrowly by only 12 votes, uh, 223 to 211. Uh, but uh, uh, the voters decided they thought that, you know, uh, electing a town treasurer was, was still the right way to go. However, they did approve eliminating the office of the town auditor uh, and future audits, audits of the town's finances will be conducted by a, a licensed uh, accountant. And that passed by a fairly comfortable 294 to 133 margin. Uh, Dan Harvey, the select board chairman, was re-elected to the select board. Uh, uh, and uh, Glenn Sherman Jr. won election to the seat. Uh, was being vacated by Tim Williams, an incumbent uh, office holder. Uh, I I believe neither of them faced opposition uh, to those candidates. Uh, over on the school district side in Arlington, the uh, voters approved the $7.1 million school budget. Um, and in, in a contested race for a school board seat there, uh, Dan Wood defeated Jeff Tilley by a 211 to 163 margin. Uh, the school board uh, chairman, uh, Todd Wilkins, uh, was also going to be returning to the school board. He, he won re-election, uh, uh, no opponent there. Um, up in Dorset, uh, voters approved uh, a $2.2 million in spending on the highway and general fund, um, and as well as the, uh, uh, a group of other community organizations. Uh, there were no contested races for the town's offices this year, three uh, Incumbent members of the select board uh, were returned to serve additional terms. Um, among the uh, among the articles that the voters passed uh, was uh, to alleviate uh, or exempt uh, the Wilson House uh, from property taxes for five years. The Wilson House is the home of uh, one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous um, and uh, has been hit hard by the uh, like all inns and uh, hospitality businesses have, uh, has been hit hard by um, the the pandemic and uh, hasn't been hasn't been able to open, and uh, so voters there gave them uh, that bit of help to uh, hopefully continue uh, their work uh, in helping uh, folks who are suffering from uh, alcoholism and uh, and other addictions. Uh, very important work that they're doing there. Um, the other thing that uh, voters in Dorset got to check out was a preview of uh, what their new town office might look like in the not too distant future. Uh, there's, it's been proposed to move the town office from its current location in East Dorset, uh, right around the corner from the Wilson House, as it turns out, uh, to another location uh, on Raptor Lane, uh, a little bit uh, further south of town, uh, on Route 30. Um, town acquired uh, a large parcel of land there uh, a few years ago, and uh, one of the ideas of you know, putting it, some of that property to use would be to to uh, build a, a new, more modern building uh, that would be give a little more space to uh, for town meetings and, and uh, town offices. So uh, uh, more to come on all of that, but uh, voters got got to check that out. What some of the initial designs look like. Uh, the, village, the village of Dorset, uh, as opposed to Dorset and East Dorset, uh, also voted to uh, pass uh, uh, a measure that will upgrade their municipal water lines. That passed by a very comfortable 335 to 50 vote margin. Uh, and uh, that, of course, has been an ongoing subject in Dorset uh, in recent years. 
uh, with a very aging municipal water system uh, leaking a lot of water, wasting a lot of water. And in the past couple of years, some of you will remember that they've had to uh, place some restrictions on water use, particularly during the summers or when uh, when the reservoir uh, reached dangerously low levels. So um, that's a step forward in that, on that front. Uh, and up in Peru, uh, uh, voters passed all the articles on their warning, uh, with the exception of one that uh, we talked a little bit about in one of the uh, uh, preview shows that we did about town meeting. Uh, there was a proposal to uh, spend about $200,000 to construct a, a multi-use pavilion on the town green. Uh, I guess it's an area where a lot of folks go ice skating when the, the water freezes over and, and the fire department up there is uh, kind of helped manage that. Uh, but uh, that proposal to uh, build a, a formal pavilion uh, failed by a 60 to 39 vote margin uh, up in Peru. In the Taconic and Green voting, uh, the school, the regional school district, its budget was approved. Uh, uh, it also, the voters also approved the proposed tuition rate for Burn Burton Academy. That uh, was going up about $500, I think, uh, off the top of my head, both for uh, inside the, the 11 or 12 towns in the sending district, as well as uh, those who are coming, students who are coming from outside the sending district. Also, that tuition rate going up by $500. Um, Jeff Wilson and Alexander Weil were elected to uh, posts as school directors for the Taconic and Green, and uh, there will also be a special appointed uh, school director named on uh, March 9th uh, uh, for Manchester. Uh, also, just one thought worth noting that uh, the Southwest Tech uh, uh, School, uh, formerly known as the Career Development Center uh, down in Bennington, uh, also had uh, a very competitive race for four open seats on their board of directors. Uh, Southwest Tech, as uh, many of you know, is a, uh, teaches trades and vocational school uh, 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 classes and uh, plays a very important role in helping uh, uh, many kids develop some skills and, uh, and tradecraft. Uh, so the four winners of those seats included Mike Cutler uh, uh, and Anthony T.J. Williams, uh, Jackie Kelly, and Asher Edelson. So congratulations to all those winners. Um, meanwhile, uh, up in Danby and, and in, in Paulette, uh, those two communities joined, uh, I believe, a total of 17 other towns around the state in approving or opting in uh, to allowing retail uh, shops or retail operations to sell uh, recreational cannabis or marijuana. Um, those shops won't be able to open until August, uh, excuse me, October 20, October of 2022, uh, over a year and a half from now, but uh, uh, they, um, following uh, an earlier piece of legislation from the State House that allowed for uh, those types of shops to open uh, required, however, that the local towns gave approval for that so they could opt in, as it were. Um, but anyway, those the, those two communities uh, said yes to that. All Bennington did, the town of Bennington did as well. Um, there are about uh, 27 towns altogether around the state that uh, had that on their, on their warnings. So, uh, We'll see how that goes. Uh, and meanwhile, worth noting up in Paulette, uh, they also had a very uh, lively select board race up there um, for uh, two, uh, well, three seats, I guess, were in play. Uh, John Malcolm, the one, uh, an incumbent uh, select board member and also the vice chairman of the board, won re-election, uh, as did, um, uh, let me see, uh, let me get their names here correctly. Uh, Rich Hewlett and Jessica Van Ort. They also won the other two seats uh, that were up for grabs in the Bullet Select Board race, uh, which of course became uh, sort of notable for the presence of Daniel Banyai, who uh, was running for both those two seats. Uh, and Mr. Banyai is the owner of Slate Ridge uh, Firearms Trading Facility in West Bullet. It's been in the news a little bit. Uh, uh, 
some zoning issues with that and, and also some social media issues. Uh, anyway, uh, Mr. Banyai uh, came in last in both those races. Um, so uh, that's where we'll leave that one. Uh, meanwhile, today, the governor uh, also had his uh, regular Friday press conference uh, to bring us up to date on what's happening on the uh, COVID uh, front and uh, uh, whatever else may, might be uh, uh, involved with that. Uh, he began the press conference by noticing, no, noting that it was almost exactly uh, one year ago that the first uh, case of COVID uh, in Vermont, which happened to be in Bennington, uh, was, was announced. Um, and one year later, we are now uh, close to vaccinating uh, almost one third of, of, of all Vermonters, or at least uh, one third have, have gotten at least one uh, dose of the two dose uh, vaccination process. Uh, he hinted that there will be some more announcements about loosening restrictions that will be coming next week. Uh, about a week or so ago, he said that uh, they'd be loosening the quarantining and, and travel restrictions for those who had received vaccinations uh, and hinted uh, broadly that there would be more to follow and we should all stay tuned for that. Uh, those announcements coming early next week. Senator Pat Leahy also joined by teleconference uh, uh, and uh, gave some good news uh, to all listening. Uh, the uh, Senate COVID uh, relief bill that it's working working its way through Congress, it's uh, it's passed the House of Representatives now now in the Senate. That would include an additional four hundred million dollars for, for Vermont uh, in that COVID relief bill. Uh, about a hundred million or so would be available to spend on infrastructure, uh, including broadband improvements, and um, about fifty million dollars for home for a homeowner assistance fund. Uh, so that was obviously very welcome news uh, for for the governor and uh, his team. Um, Secretary Dan French, the Education Secretary, gave us a few updates on how things were going uh, with uh, returning uh, schools to in-person learning, and uh, he indicated that uh, it would likely be happening fairly uh, that more by the spring there would be a good chance that uh, more students will be back in in classrooms. Um, and the big news on that front also was that uh, earlier this week. Uh, the state of Vermont announced that it was going to be expanding the number of uh, people eligible to be vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus, and that would include teachers and child care workers, uh, Governor Scott said last, last Tuesday. Um, that had been a bit of a, a discussion point uh, between education officials, parents, uh, about how to, how to get schools open as quickly as possible or get things as back to normal as quickly as possible and, and uh, vaccinating teachers and uh, educators uh, as well as staff who work in school buildings was, uh, was a point of controversy. Uh, but that was alleviated, I guess, by the uh, greater amount of vaccines that's uh, become available than they expected. They had been, as you know, sticking with a fairly uh, tight age band uh, formula, starting with Vermonters 75 and older, reducing it down to 70 and older, then this week uh, reducing it to 65 year olds and older. Uh, but now teachers and childcare workers will be also uh, able to get those uh, vaccinations. Um, on the vaccination front, about 113, more th slightly more than 113,000 Vermonters have received at least one dose, uh, uh, Administration Secretary Mike Smith said. Um, and uh, that will about do it for today. Um, hope you're all looking forward to a good weekend. Uh, hope the weather uh, stays nice. And uh, we'll see you again next week. So for the GNET TV News Project, uh, it's been my pleasure to be with you today. Andrew McKeever. Um, and we'll see you next Friday. Have a great one.